Hey guys, welcome back to another True Crime Thursday. Today I'm going to be talking about the crimes of Belle Gunness, who just, you know, likes to murder everyone she comes in contact with. So, let's get into it. Born Brynhild Paulsdetter Storseth on November 11th, 1859 in Selbu, Norway. Brynhild was the youngest daughter of eight children born of stonemaster Paul Pedersen Storseth and Birrit Olstetter. She was raised on a small farm in Inbygda, Inbygda? Norway and grew up to be physically very strong, like standing at 5'9 and weighing over 200 pounds, but she wasn't like fat. She was like muscle. Like she had some strength to her. One common but unverified story says that when she was 18 years old, she was pregnant and attended a country dance. While there, she was attacked by a man who kicked her in the stomach, causing her to miscarry. The man who came from a rich family was never prosecuted by Norwegian authorities. Afterward, the locals said that Brynhild's personality drastically changed. I mean, understandably. I would be pissed off if that were me, so I get it. A short time later, the man who had kicked her died of what is said to be stomach cancer. I wouldn't be surprised if she poisoned his ass, and honestly, I wouldn't blame her for it. She then went out to work as a servant on a wealthy farm for the next several years. Then, in 1881, following the example of her sisters, who had immigrated to America earlier, Brynhild moved to the United States, where she assumed a more American-style name, Belle. She then made her way to Chicago, Illinois, where she again worked as a servant for a time. Belle married Mads Sorensen in 1884. Sorensen and Belle owned a candy store that burned to the ground. The couple's home had also burned down, and both instances grant the couple insurance payouts. The pair had four children, Caroline, Axel, Myrtle, and Lucy. Caroline and Axel died as infants from acute coliitis the symptoms of which were nausea, fever, diarrhea, and lower abdominal pain and cramping, which were also signs of many poisonings. Huh. <laughs> they collected on life insurance policies for both children. On July 30th, 1900, Albert Sorsen, on the one day his two life insurance policies overlapped, died. The first doctor to see him thought he had suffered from strychnine poisoning. However, the Sorensen's family doctor had him had been treating him for an enlarged heart, and he concluded that death had been caused by heart failure. An autopsy was considered unnecessary because the death was not thought to be suspicious. That's a lie. <laughs> it's totally fucking suspicious. Though her husband's family demanded an inquiry claiming Belle had poisoned her husband to collect on the insurance, no charges were filed. In the end, she was awarded $8,500, which today is about $240,000 with which she bought a farm on the outskirts of Laporte, Indiana. It was reported that both the boat and carriage houses burned to the ground shortly after she acquired the property. As she was preparing to move from Chicago to Laporte, she became reacquainted with a recent widower named Peter Gunness, who was also from Norway. Gunness, a butcher by profession, and Belle were married in Laporte on April 1st, 1902. Just one week after the ceremony, Peter's infant daughter died of an uncertain cause while alone in the house with Belle. In December 1902, Peter himself met with a tragic end. According to Bell, he was struck on the head when a sausage grinding machine had toppled off a high shelf in the kitchen. But when the coroner looked at the body, he allegedly muttered, This is a case of murder. To make matters worse, one of Bell's own children told a classmate that her mother had hit her husband over the head with a cleaver. Though the authorities investigated, the formidable Bell was so convincing that no charges were ever filed. A year later, Peter's brother, Gust, took Peter's older daughter, Swanhild, to Wisconsin. She was the only child to have survived to live with Bell. Bell's husband's death netted her another $3,000, about $81,000 today. Local people refused to believe that her husband could be so clumsy. He had a run a hog farm on the property and was known to be an experienced butcher. So when a meat machine suddenly hits him in the head, doesn't make any sense. Probably because she killed him. 
doesn't make sense because uh, it doesn't make sense. The district coroner reviewed the case, unequivocally announced that he had been murdered, and convened a coroner's jury to look into the matter. However, Gunna successfully convinced the investigators that she was innocent. Damn, she is charismatic as fuck. At the time, Gunness did not mention that she was pregnant, despite the possibility that it might have injured sympathy, and in May 1903, Gunness gave birth to a son named Philip. In late 1906, Bell told neighbors that her foster daughter, Jenny Olson, had gone away to Lutheran College in Los Angeles. And we all know that's probably not true. In 1907, she hired the help of a farmhand named Ray Lampier to help with chores. However, word soon spread that her relationship with him was more than strictly professional. When drinking, he often boasted of sleeping with his employer, which came as a surprise to those who only saw Belle as a burly woman who liked to dress in men's overalls and do her own hog butchering. She was a very manly woman. There was another side to the woman that he saw, and soon the local folk would as well. He would not be enough for Belle. She wanted something more, and soon began to look for new suitors by inserting the following advertisement in the lovelorn column of newspapers in large Midwestern cities. Personal. Commonly widow who owns a large farm in one of the finest districts in LaPorte County, Indiana, desires to make the acquaintance of a gentleman equally well provided, with the view of joining fortunes. No replies by letter considered unless the sender is willing to follow the answer with a personal visit. Triflers need not apply. Several middle-aged men of means responded to Gunness's ads, and within no time, Belle was often seen going for carriage rides with strangers on Sunday afternoons. On those occasions, Belle was wearing the finest clothing, and her hair was adorned in the latest style. Usually accompanied by a handsome man, she was unrecognizable from the tough farm woman the locals were used to seeing. One of these men was John Moe, who arrived from Elbow Lake, Minnesota. He had brought more than a thousand dollars with him to pay off her mortgage, so or so he told his neighbors, to whom Gunness introduced him as her cousin. He disappeared from her farm within a week. Next came George Anderson from Tarkio, Missouri, who said he would pay off the mortgage if they decided to wed. Late that night, while sleeping in the guest room, Anderson awoke startled to find Belle standing over him, peering into his eyes and holding a candle in her hand. He later stated that the expression on her face was so sinister and murderous that he let out a loud yell and she immediately ran from the room. Feeling terrified and uncomfortable, Anderson believed that Gunness intended to murder him, which was probably accurate. He quickly jumped out of bed and threw on his clothes. He fled the house without even saying goodbye and ran away, getting on the first train headed back to Missouri. He never returned for his belongings, nor did he speak to Gunness again. Well, at least he got out. At least he got out. The suitors kept coming, but none, except for the lucky Anderson, ever left the Gunness farm. In the meantime, she began ordering large trunks to be delivered, kept the shutters of her home closed day and night, and kept mostly to herself. Old B. Budsberg, an elderly widower from Lola, Wisconsin, appeared next. He was last seen alive at the Laporte Savings Bank on April 6, 1907, when he mortgaged his Wisconsin land there, signed over a deed, and obtained several thousand dollars in cash. Budson's sons had no idea that their father had gone off to visit Gunson. When they finally discovered his destination, they wrote to her, and she promptly responded, saying she had never seen him. Several other middle-aged men appeared and disappeared in brief visits to the Gunness farm throughout 1907. Then, in December 1907, Andrew Hilligan, a bachelor farmer from Aberdeen, South Dakota, wrote to her and was warmly received. The pair exchanged many letters, until a letter arrived that overwhelmed Andrew. Written in Gunness's own careful handwriting and dated January 13, 1908, this letter was later found at the Hilligan farm. It read, To the dearest friend in the world, no woman in the world is happier than I am. I know that you are now to come to me and be my own. I can tell from your letters that you are the man I want. It does not take one long to tell when they like a person. And you I like better than anyone in the world, I know. Think how we will enjoy each other's company, you the sweetest man in the whole world. We will be all alone with each other. Can you conceive of anything nicer? I think of you constantly when I hear your name mentioned. And this is when one of the dear children speaks of you, or I hear myself humming it with the words of an old love song. It is beautiful music to my ears. My heart beats in wild rapture for you. My Andrew, I love you. Come prepared to stay forever. 
because you're going to be buried in her backyard. In response to her letter, Andrew rushed to her side in January of 1908. He had with him a check for $2,900, his savings, which he had drawn from his local bank. A few days after Andrew arrived, he and Gundness appeared at the savings bank in the port and deposited the money. At this time, Bell started to have problems with her farmhand, Ray Lampier. Ray was deeply in love with Belle and performed any chore for her, no matter how gruesome. He was jealous of many men who arrived to court his employer, and up to this time had endured most of these attentive strangers. However, when he was introduced to Andrew, Belle's new husband-to-be, he made a scene and Belle promptly fired him on February 3rd, 1908. A few days later, Andrew was gone, but Belle appeared at the bank to make an additional $1,200 deposit. Shortly after dispensing with Ray, she presented herself at the LaPorte County Courthouse, declaring that her former employee was not in his right mind and was a menace to the public. Somehow, she convinced local authorities to hold a sanity hearing, but Ray was pronounced sane and released. Belle was back a few days later to complain to the sheriff that Ray had visited her farm and argued with her. She contended that he posed a threat to her family and had Ray arrested for trespassing. Despite the arrest, Ray returned again and again to see her, but he, but she drove him away. On one occasion, he confided in a neighboring farm. Andrew won't bother me no more. We fixed him for keeps. But for Andrew's brother, Isle, the matter was far from over. Disturbed when Andrew failed to return home, Isle wrote to Belle asking her about his sibling's whereabouts. Belle wrote back, telling Isle, that his brother was not at the farm and probably went to Nori to visit relatives. Isle wrote back saying that he did not believe his brother would do that and that he believed that his brother was still in the port. Bravely, Belle responded that if he wanted to come and look for his brother, she would help conduct a search. If she was involved, he would have to pay her. Cheap bitch. Next, Belle presented herself to a lawyer in the port named M. E. Lieter, telling him that she feared for her life and that of her children. Ray, she said, had threatened to kill her and burn her house down, and she wanted to make out a will in case he went through with his threats. The will was completed, leaving her estate to her children. However, she never went to the police to tell them that Ray allegedly threatened their lives. In January 1908, Belle hired another man named Joe Maxson to help her with the farm. A couple of months later, Maxson awoke in the early hours of April 28, 1908, smelling smoke in his room, which was on the second floor of the house. He opened the hall door to a sheet of flames and screamed Belle's name and those of her children, but got no response. He slammed the door and then, in his underwear, leaped from the second-story window, barely surviving the fire that was closing in around him. That's freaking terrifying. He raced to town to get help, but by the time it arrived, the house was already in smoking ruins. Four bodies were found inside the house, the headless corpse of a woman and three children. On site was County Sheriff Albert Smutzer, who had heard of Ray's alleged threats. Taking in the grisly scene, he immediately concluded that the fire was no accident, but rather arson and murder. He then sent two of his deputies digging into the debris for the corpse's missing head, and sent two others to arrest Ray. When the former handyman was brought in, he denied having anything to do with the fire, claiming that he was not near the farm when the blaze occurred. However, a neighbor boy said that he had seen Ray running down the road from the house just before the structure erupted in flames. Ray was arrested and charged with murder, with his cries of innocence falling on deaf ears. At first, investigators believed the bodies to be those of Belle and her three children, Myrtle, age 11, Lucy, age 9, and Philip, age 5. But, from the start, there were questions as to whether the headless corpse was that of Belle at all. The woman in the fire was estimated to be approximately 5'3 and weighed about 125 pounds, which, as I said earlier, Belle was 5'9 and about 200 pounds. That's a, that's a big difference. Significantly smaller than Belle. Furthermore, several neighbors and friends viewed the corpse, including two neighboring farms and several friends who all said it was not Belle. The local dentist then stepped in, stating that if any dental work could be found, he could make a positive identification. The investigators then began to sift through the debris, and a piece of bridge work was found. The dentist identified it as work done on Bell. As a result, the coroner, Charles Mack, officially concluded that the adult female body discovered in the ruins was Bell, even though the body doesn't fit the description of Bell at all, but whatever, you know, it's fine. 
As the investigation was ongoing, Isle arrived in Laporte from South Dakota and told Sheriff Smutzer that he believed his brother Andrew had been met with foul play at Bell's farm. He also stated that Andrew had answered a matrimonial ad that had been placed by Bell in a Norwegian language newspaper. In her reply, Bell offered her true love and a life of wedded bliss, but also mentioned a quick $1,000 that she needed to pay off her mortgage. When Andrew left home, he withdrew his life savings from the bank and was never heard from again. Isle became even more convinced of foul play when he went out to the ruins of Belle's home and watched the men digging for her head turn up eight men's watches, assorted bones, and human teeth. Oh! <laughs> he searched through the property on his own and shouted to the men to start digging in the rubbish hole that was located in Belle's hog pen. As they began turning the earth, they found four bodies, all of them skillfully sliced apart and wrapped in oil cloth, one of the bodies belonging to Andrew. Joe Maxson came forward with information that could not be ignored. He told the sheriff that Bell had ordered him to bring loads of dirt by wheelbarrow to a large area surrounded by a high wire fence where the, fo where the hogs were fed. Maxson said that there were many deep impressions in the ground that he had been covered by dirt. These filled in holes, Bell had told Maxson, contained rubbish. She wanted the ground made level, so he filled in the depressions. At the same time, several farmers who had traveled past the farm at night reported having seen Belle digging with a shovel in the hog pen in the middle of the night. Just like, digging holes. <laughs> The Sheriff Smutzer then took a dozen men back to the farm and began to dig. On May 3rd, 1908, the diggers unearthed the body of Jenny Olson, who had vanished in December of 1906. There she is. Then, they found the small bodies of two unidentified children. As days progressed and the gruesome work continued, one body after another was discovered in Bell's hog pen. Those who could be identified included Oil Ol B. Budson of Lola, Wisconsin, who vanished May 1907. Thomas Limbeau, who had left Chicago and had gone to work as a hired man for Bell three years earlier. Henry Gofold of Scandinavia, Wisconsin. There's a city in Wisconsin called Scandinavia. Who had gone to wed her a year earlier, taking fifteen hundred dollars. A watch corresponding to one belonging to Goodhold was found with the body. Olaf Skunfold from Chicago, Joe Mo, John Mo from Elbow Lake, Minnesota. His watch was found in Ray's possession. Olaf Lindblom, age thirty-five, from Wisconsin, and Benjamin Carling of Chicago, Illinois, was last seen by his wife in 1907 after telling her that he was going to Laporte to secure an investment with a rich widow. He had with him $1,000 from an insurance company and had borrowed money from several investors as well. In June 1908, his widow was able to identify his remains from Laporte's Popers Cemetery by the contour of his skull and three missing teeth. The unidentified bodies and unsolved mysteries that would emerge from these ruins would make headlines Across the Midwest, more reports of missing men began to pour in from surrounding Midwestern states and relatives began to appear from all over the region to claim bodies. All of them told of lonesome brothers, uncles, and cousins answering Bell's matrimonial ads and traveling hopefully to Laporte with their life savings stuffed in their pockets. Some of these were most certainly additional victims, though they were never proven. Christy Helven of Dovray, Wisconsin, who sold his farm and came to Laporte in 1906. Charles Nieberg, a 28-year-old Scandinavian immigrant who lived in Philadelphia, told friends that he was going to visit Godness in June of 1906 and never came back. He had been working for a saloon keeper and took $500 with him. John H. McJunkin of Coriopolis, near Pittsburgh, left his wife in December 1906 after corresponding with a Laporte woman. Olaf Jensen, a Norwegian immigrant of Carroll, Indiana, wrote his relatives in 1906 who was going to marry a wealthy, wealthy widow in Laporte. Bert Chase of uh, Mishawaka, Indiana, told, sold his butcher shop and told friends of a wealthy widow that he was going to look her up. His brother received a telegram supposedly from Aberdeen, South Dakota, claiming Bert had been killed in a train wreck. His brother investigated and found the telegram was fake. Are she faking telegrams now? A hired man named George Bradley of T Tuscola, Illinois, uh, is allegedly to have gone to Laporte to meet a widow and three children in October of 1907. T.J. Tiefland of Minneapolis is alleged to have come to see Gunness in 1907. Frank Rendinger, a farmer of Waukesha, Wisconsin, came to Indiana in 1907 to marry and never returned. Emil Tell, a Swede from Kansas City, Missouri, alleged to have gone in 1907 to Laporte. Lee Porter of 
Bartonville, Oklahoma, separated from his wife and told his brother he was going to marry a wealthy widow in Laporte. John E. Hunter left Duquesne, Pennsylvania on November 25th, 1907, after telling his daughters he was going to marry a wealthy widow in northern Indiana. Lastly, Abraham Phillips, a railway man of Burlington, West Virginia, left in the winter of 1907 to go to northern Indiana and marry a rich widow. A railway watch was found in the debris of the house. Reported other unnamed victims have been a daughter of Miss H. Witzer of Toledo, Ohio, who had attended Valparaiso University near Laporte in 1902. An unknown man and woman are alleged to have disappeared in September 1906, the same night Jenny Olson went missing. Bell claimed they were a Los Angeles professor and his wife who had taken Jenny to California. A brother of Ms. Jenny Graham of Waukesha, Wisconsin, who had left her to marry a rich widow in Laporte, had vanished. A hired man from Ohio, age 50, name unknown, is alleged to have disappeared and Bell became the heir to his horse and buggy. An unknown man from Montana told people at a resort he was going to tell Bell He's going to sell Bell his horse and buggy, which was found with several other horse and buggies at the farm. Most of the remains found on the property could not be identified. Because of the crude recovery methods, the exact number of individuals on Earth on the farm is unknown. But 14 of Bell's victims were placed together with a number of teeth, bones, and watches left over. In all, the number murdered was estimated to be as many as 40. On May 22, 1908, Ray was tried for murder and arson. He pled innocent to all charges, his defense hinging on the assertion that the body was not Bell. Ray's lawyer, Wirt Warden, developed evidence that the bridge work that was found may have been planted. In the end, Ray was found guilty of arson but acquitted of murder. On November 26, 1908, he was sentenced to 2 to 21 years in state prison in Michigan City, Indiana. He died there of tuberculosis on December 30, 1909. A few weeks later, a reverend came forward with a confession that Ray made to him before he died. In his statement, he revealed the details of Bell's crimes and swore that she was still alive. He also swore to the reverend as well as a fellow convict that he had not murdered anyone. However, he had helped Bell bury many of her victims. When a victim arrived, she would make him comfortable, charming him, cooking him a large meal. She then drugged his coffee, and when the man was in a stupor, she split his head with a meat chopper. At other times, she would simply wait for the men to fall asleep and attack them in their bedroom by candlelight. The powerful 48-year-old woman would then carry the body to the basement where she most often dissected it, bundled the remains, and then buried them in the hog pen. At other times, she dumped the corpse into a hog-scaling vat and then covered the remains with quicklime. And worse, according to Ray, if she was overly tired, she would chop up the remains and feed them to the pigs. Ray also cleared up the mysterious question of the headless female corpse found in the smoking ruins of Bell's home. Bell had lured this woman from Chicago on the pretense of hiring her as a housekeeper only days before she decided to make her permanent escape from Laporte. Bell, according to Ray, had drugged the woman, then bashed her head. Once dead, she decapitated the body, tied weights to the head, and disposed of it in a swamp. She then dragged the corpse to the basement, dressed it in her own clothing, removed her false teeth, and placed them beside the headless corpse to ensure it would be identified as Belle. She also chloroformed her children, smothered them to death, and then carried them to the basement. She then torched the small brick farmhouse and fled. Ray was to wait for her at the designated place on the road after the fire was set, but she never showed up. Instead, she cut across open fields and disappeared into the woods. The former handyman also stated that Bell had become a very rich woman. By his count, she had murdered about 42 men and had taken amounts from ranging from $1,000 to $32,000. By the time she disappeared, he estimated that she had accumulated more than $250,000 through her murder schemes over the years. A huge fortune for those days, which is about $6.7 million today. The investigators had previously checked her bank accounts, and though there was a small amount remaining in one of her savings accounts, the money and all other accounts had been completely withdrawn shortly before the fire, suggesting that the evil woman had created a great hoax and evaded the law. Over the next several decades, Bell was allegedly cited in various cities across the nation. As late as 1931, Bell was reported alive and living in a Mississippi town where she supposedly owned a great deal of property and lived her life as a prominent citizen. Another report in 1931 suggested that she had met 
she may have been a woman known as Esther Carlson, who was arrested in Los Angeles, California, for poisoning August Lindstrom, a Norwegian-American man, for his money on February 9th, 1931. Two people have been known... Two people who had known Belle claimed to recognize her from photographs that were in her possession, but the identification was never proved. Carlson died on May 6, 1931, while awaiting trial. Of the remains found at the murder site, the bodies of Belle's three children were identified, as well as several other of her suitors. The headless adult female corpse was never positively identified. In the belief that the headless corpse was in fact Belle, the remains were buried next to Belle's first husband, Mad Sorensen, at Forest Home Cemetery in Forest Park, Illinois. On November 5, 2007, with the remission of descendants of Belle's sister, the headless body was exhumed from the grave by a team of forensic anthropologists and graduate students from the University of Annapolis, Annapolis in an effort to learn her true identity. It was initially hoped that a sealed envelope flap on a letter found at the victim's farm would contain enough DNA to be compared to that of the body. Unfortunately, there was not enough DNA, so the mystery remains unsolved. To conclude, I think she's I think she got out. Yes, it's possible that the body that's headless is Belle. But if it is Belle, then she was murdered. Because you can't really cut off your own head. So, either A, it was her, and maybe Ray finally snapped, or someone else. And they killed her and her children and let the house on fire. Possible. But, but, the body of the headless woman, which they never found the head, sauce, um, was, like, six inches shorter than Belle was, much skinnier, and the only thing identifying her were the teeth, which could have been taken out, like the, the work. And people who knew Belle could not identify the body as Belle. They have not been able to get a surefire, like, DNA going, this is Belle. Her children, yes, but her, no. Plus, she took out a ton of money right before the fire happened. She's done this before. She probably was like, oh shit, people are catching on to me. I gotta get out. I honestly do think that she got out. Is it possible that body is Belle? Yeah, it is. It is possible that was Belle. But, deep down, I think we all know that it's not. I mean, there's a chance. But, I truly believe that she did get out. And that she ran. Where she went to, no one knows. You know, no one knows for sure where she went. But... I think she got out. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed as much as you can enjoy a story like this. I'll be back again on Thursday with another True Crime Thursday and Monday with whatever I decide to post. Alright guys, I'll see you later.